Well, welcome to lecture 25 in social neuroscience. This uh, particular lecture, I call it war and peace, but it's really not so much about war or peace. Um, in fact, the, this lecture touches on different things that are brought up in chapters 15, 16, and 17 in Sapolsky's book, Behave. Um, in these final chapters of Behave, Sapolsky basically covers lots of different topics having to do with social justice, having to do with forgiveness, peace, war, a bunch of different things. And what I'm going to focus on today is about anger and anger and aggression. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of this work and how it's related to um, maybe policies and things we could change in society. So I'll begin with talking about what is anger all about. Then we'll talk about anger and motivation and some interesting research that looked at that. Then we'll spotlight on Tom Denson's research on anger provoked aggression. And then we'll have this conclusion on looking at some research about implications for society. All right, let's take anger here and think about it a little bit. Um, anger is an interesting emotion, something we humans um, experience quite a bit. Um, in fact, what is anger all about? Well, Averill back in 1982 did some diary studies where he had these uh, participants record all sorts of different emotions they had in their everyday lives. And he concluded that depending on how the records are kept, most people report becoming mildly to moderately angry anywhere from several times a day to several times a week. So this is a, an emotion that people report experiencing frequently, and thus we probably do run into other people who are mildly to moderately angry all the time. Um, sometimes we might not realize how angry they are, but we probably are quite sensitive to noticing anger in other people. In fact, lots of research shows this. Um, there's this old research uh, called the face in the crowd effect that was uh, originally reported by Hansen and Hansen, and what they noticed was that we spot angry faces more easily in a crowd of faces. And so you can see stimuli like this, where you can see a face that looks angry. It's easy to spot amongst an array of other kinds of different facial expressions. Also, angry expressors are generally perceived as more threatening, powerful, and dominant when they are expressing their angry face. And even 10-week-old infants respond differently to angry faces than sad faces. So they are noticing differences um, at that young age between the configuration of the face that is we associate with anger. So it does seem, tend to be something we see in other people quite easily. We, we ourselves experience angry, anger probably very frequently as well. So at least it's this question, why did humans evolve the ability to feel anger or Maybe it's just all about learning. Well, this answer about maybe it's just all learning, I think is something that Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's at Northeastern University, would probably say. Um, and, and instead, what, in fact, what uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett has argued is that um, she's been focusing on this thing that she calls the emotion paradox, where um, just generally speaking about different emotions, she says we experience happiness, fear, anger, et cetera. I mean, we all know that we feel these different kinds of emotions, but according to Barrett and her colleagues in the research they do, we don't really find examples of such emotion centers in the brain. We don't have like a happiness um, part of the brain, a fear part of the brain, the anger part of the brain. And because we don't really have these specific emotion centers, she doesn't think that perhaps we really have de dedicated circuits to each of these different emotions. What actually exists, according to uh, Feldman Barrett, is affect. That is, we generally just experience things, or at least our brains, um, experience the world in terms of valence and arousal. So valence has to do with how positive or negative an event is. So as you move around the world, you do have reactions to things that are negative or positive. Also how arousing different things are. They're really quite disturbing arousing or they're very calming and peaceful. And as we experience these different things in our lives, we also learn about different emotions from the way that we're socialized. So during development, we learn about the concept of anger and apply it when we experience that affect in a certain situation. So when we get a particular kind of combination of valence and arousal, perhaps it's a very negative valence and highly arousal that in those kind of circumstances where we're feeling this really negative feeling with a lot of arousal, we recognize that we're in a situation that's causing us to feel anger, and therefore we label it just from our learning. We've learned that this kind of situation is causing us to feel angry. And so we then report, I feel angry, or you uh, think about it to yourself that you're feeling angry. And so 
in this constructive, constructivist view of emotion, what Feldman Barron and her colleagues are arguing is that we really don't have like a naturally occurring anger response. Just maybe she would argue then that other animals wouldn't have this angry response either. It's just that we humans have developed from culture, from our development to take the situation, take these feelings of affect, put them together, and then construct the emotion of anger. Now, an alternative point of view to this would be one that's proposed these days by Dr. Keltner, who's at UC Berkeley. Um, and the answer that Keltner and other people would make is that we end up feeling angry because we're making cognitive appraisals of the world. And it's not just Keltner, there's also Lazarus and Kappas and other people who also make this argument. Um, that, uh, that is what, what happens is we go around in the world and we view changes in the world. We notice things that are happening and we will process it more if that change that's happening outside of us is relevant to ourselves. So we kind of notice that there's been some sort of change. There's a stimulus out there and we quickly figure out, is this something that's relevant to me? Like, um, you know, is this thing coming at me? Is this something that has to do with my actions? And if it's something that is relevant to us, we process it more. And we might notice then that it's something positive or just something negative. So we have that valence component that uh, Feldman Barrett was talking about. But we kind of notice that and say, oh, that's something negative. And then we might realize that that person intentionally meant to do the negative thing to us. Okay. So we see that that other person is doing something negative to us. And then we realize that that negative thing is hurting us. And because of that series of steps of quickly analyzing this as something negative that the other person intended to do and it's hurting us, we have a response of anger. And so that's our emotion. So it's, it's, it's almost like more like a computer program, like where you could actually take a bunch of inputs and then it would output anger. And so it's not a constructivist point of view. Um, it may come from learning, but it also could just be that we're sort of hardwired to easily make these sorts of appraisals and therefore we have our anger. So this approach is called the appraisal theory of emotion. I'll just say as a side note here that Dr. Keltner was a consultant on the film Inside Out, that Pixar movie about different emotions. And Keltner um, did lend his expertise on emotions to that particular film. And then it's interesting that after the film came out, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote an article in which she said that um, the makers of Inside Out got emotions all wrong because she doesn't believe there's like each of these different specific emotions. And so she sort of like uh, came out with a, a contradictory explanation of about emotion that fits really well with the way that these days Feldman Barrett and Keltner are sort of in theoretical opposites of each other. Well, anyway, whether it's the Keltner method or it's the Feldman Barrett method, once we are angry, what happens? Well, we could have behavioral outcomes. That is, we may be motivated to approach the person who's causing us harm. We might want to confront them because we're feeling angry. That seems to be a very typical behavioral intention of our experience of feeling angry. And we may even become aggressive either directly, you know, like directly being aggressive verbally or physically, or maybe it's indirect. We go ahead and harm that person back by harming or damaging something else that's in their life, some belonging they have or another person. So, the idea here is that we maybe want some restoration. You know, we want to confront this person who's causing us harm, and so we might be aggressive back towards them. The anger might also be so strong that it spills out onto others who are not even involved. And the idea here is that you get so angry, and then maybe you can't directly respond to the person who's making you feel angry, so what you do is you take it out on somebody else. And that's called displaced aggression, when your aggression is directed at an innocent person or an innocent animal or machine or whatever it was that has nothing to do with what's actually causing you to feel the anger in the first place. Also, you can see that once we are angry, another important thing that help us, helps us to function at work, helps us in customer service, uh, you know, whatever we are in situations where we might feel angry, we're going to need to use self-regulation to stay in control. We can't just let ourselves get angry and confront people every time somebody um, does us some potential harm. So we may need to use self-regulation to stay in control. So that's going to be another sort of consequence of feeling angry. All right. So that, with that as a background, let's move on and talk more about anger and motivation. And, and this is a really interesting study that I think also sets up um, a little bit about the way that you could study anger and aggression in the laboratory if you're a social neuroscientist. So it goes back to a finding from back in the early 90s, and it has to do with EEG asymmetry, all right? So what this study 
uh, by Henriques and Davidson showed back in 1991. This wasn't actually about anger, it was about depression. And what they did is they recorded EEG activity across the scalp and near the frontal sites up here and central sites. So you kind of like more front and center here. They looked at left versus right hemisphere activity while people were depressed or people were in a control group. So they had these people who are, I think they were asked just to think about their day and people who were actually clinically depressed or at least on a questionnaire, it indicated that they were feeling depressed. What you can see here is that you're having greater activity in the left versus the right in terms of alpha power for the depressed people. Now, what is alpha power? You might remember that in EEG, we have these really slow waves. We talked about this, by the way, for example, in um, using mu activity to look at possible mirror neurons in the human brain. The idea is you get these slow oscillations, that's alpha, all right? And when we have slow alpha oscillations like that, that pretty much tells us that that part of the brain is at rest, that there isn't much actually happening. And then what happens when we start to activate that region of the brain, it goes faster and the alpha activity disappears. So in this case, what you can see is that when people are depressed, their left hemisphere up here in the front is more at alpha. That is, it's more at rest. It doesn't seem to be very activated as they think about their daily life. And that's what we mean by hypo, which is means like less, you know, or suppressed or lower frontality in depression for people who are feeling this depression. See, in the control group, when they think about their everyday life, you can see that they're not showing very much alpha. It's gone way down. That means then that that, that part of the brain is becoming more activated. But for some reason, these people who are in the depressed group are showing more left hemisphere activation, or sorry, lower, more left alpha uh, activation in their left hemisphere when they're at rest. So it tells us that they're not really activating very much at all. So with that as sort of a backdrop, then what you can think about is like, what does that actually mean? What's going on there between the left and the right hemispheres? There's been, by the way, lots of studies that were done in the 90s that showed this again and again, this difference between left and right. And one idea is it kind of goes back to the valence idea again, that perhaps all this is about, it's about positive versus negative valence. And so maybe what happens is whenever we're feeling more positive, our left frontal becomes more activated. So we have less alpha. So if you are a person who is feeling happy and positive, you're gonna see less alpha activity in the left frontal, which means it's gonna become more activated just overall. It's becoming more used, okay? And that perhaps maybe the right frontal is more for negative valences, okay? So that's what some of the research suggested. There was other research in the 90s that suggested this had to do more with motivation so that anytime you feel like you want to approach a stimulus, you would get more left frontal activity, that is um, less alpha in the left frontal, or you could find that a person who is trying to withdraw and get away from something would show more activity in their right frontal or have less alpha in their right frontal when they were feeling withdrawal. But if you put these two things together, the valence hypothesis and the motivational hypothesis, notice that they're sort of confounding. That is, when you're feeling um, positive, what does that normally mean when you feel positive? Well, it probably means that you also want to approach the thing. So if there's something that you really like and you really, you know, some excellent looking food, you're probably going to have more left frontal activity and you're also going to probably want to approach it. So you also would have more left frontal activity. So how could we tell the difference then between whether or not that left frontal activity is about valence or that it's really about motivation, about wanting to approach? So there's this one exception and that could be anger. Anger is a negative emotion, right? And so then you would expect that if it's, the, if it's a negative emotion, that whenever you're feeling angry, you should have more right frontal activity, that is less alpha in the right frontal. But as I just mentioned, usually when we're feeling angry, we want to confront the person. We want to go towards the thing that's making us feel this harm. And so then we'd have approach. And so therefore you'd see more left frontal activity if it's about approach. So the, one of the ways you could test the valence hypothesis versus the motivational hypothesis is by making people feel angry. If you see it's more in the left frontal, there's more left frontal activity, that would tell us then that the left-right differences are really about approach versus withdrawal. If you see that in when a person's feeling angry, you're getting more right frontal, then that would tell us that this is more about a distinction between left and right uh, uh, hemisphere differences with valence, okay? So Harmons, Jones, and Sigelman looked at this, 
And like I said, this is a really good example of how you could study aggression in the laboratory. This paper was published in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology back in 2001. It involved two perception tasks for the participants. One was a person perception task and the other one was a taste perception task. At least that's what the participants believed. They thought it was about person perception and about taste perception. In the person perception task, each participant wrote an essay about an important social issue. And then they were told, by the way, that there was another participant there as well in the adjoining room. So there are two of them are sitting there with their EEG caps on and they're gonna write an, an essay about an important social issue. And they're told that we're gonna give your essay to the other person and you get to see their essay, okay? So the other person's gonna give you written feedback about your essay. And what they did is they manipulated it so that the feedback that they got from that other person was neutral or insulting. So that is the one of the independent variables they manipulated is whether or not the feedback that comes from this other person is neutral or insulting this thing that you just wrote an essay about. Now, of course, it turns out that the other participant isn't really there. It's all deception. It's fake. So they're going to believe that there's another person there and they're going to either, like I said, be randomly assigned to getting neutral feedback or insulting feedback. Here's how it would work. If you got neutral feedback, you get like a rating scale. And remember, the participant did this to the other person as well. And so they generally were polite and gave them positive feedback. But in the neutral feedback, you can see that on a one to nine scale from boring to thought provoking, they're getting like a seven from the other person. And the other participant gave moderately positive ratings on things like how intelligent they were, how thought provoking, friendly, logical, respectable, and rational they were. And then they had a place down at the bottom of the forum where they had additional comments and they could write, the other person could write about you in your essay. They could say something like, I can understand why a person would think like this. All right, so neutral feedback, a little bit on the positive side, but nothing, you know, nothing really positive. It's just sort of neutral. Now in the insulting condition or in the anger inducing feedback condition, you can see that this other participant is giving the participant, the real participant, a low rating. And they say that this is pretty much on the boring scale. And then they also gave them similarly low scores on how intelligent, friendly, logical, and so on they were. And then notice that under the additional comments they could write, I can't believe an educated person would think like this. I hope this person learns something while they're at UW. Now this is at the University of Wisconsin, so they're, meant, they're basically saying, I hope this person learns something while they're a student here because they just really don't know what they're writing. So you, and just imagine you're the participant and you get that feedback after you've written this essay from this other person over here. It's insulting, okay? It makes you possibly feel anger. Okay, so what they did was they gave them that feedback from that other person and then they recorded their EEG immediately after the feedback. This is where we're gonna be able to see that left versus right asymmetry immediately after the feedback. And then after they've done that, they now go ahead and ask the participant to complete a taste perception task. This turns out to be really a measure of aggression. All right, so what happens is a participant, the, the real participant, selects a beverage for the other participant to drink. So that, that, so that the experimenter can remain blind to the type of beverage. So they bring out this little tray of little beverages and they say to the actual real participant, could you please help me? I need to have you pick one of these glasses that I can then give to the other participant, but I need to be blind. So I'm gonna ask you to choose it. And they gave them six possible beverages that range from pleasant tasting um, drinks like sweetened water to an unpleasant tasting drink, water that had hot sauce in it. And so they had them like on a scale from one to six. And so the idea here is that the participant can go through and pick which one they want to give them. They can say, you know, I'd really like to have that other participant taste the sweet water or I want them to taste the hot sauce or something in between, right? So it's kind of like this. You see this array of beverages in front of you. The participant's got their EEG cap on and they're going to pour a bottle like that into a cup to give to the other um, participant. So that's their measure of aggression. If they're feeling really angry, the thing you could retaliate with and be aggressive to the other participant is you could go ahead and give them the, the water with the hot sauce if that's what they're gonna have to taste. Um, if you don't really feel anything bad about them, you can go ahead and grab a bottle there with the sugar water and pour that into the cup. But you do all this while the experimenter's out of the room. But of course, the experimenter knows exactly which bottle the participant do, do, uses, so that's their, gonna be their measure of aggression. So what did they discover? What did they find out in this study? Well, you can see that we have our two main conditions here. We have the neutral condition. So half the participants are in the neutral condition, half of them are in the insult condition. And you can see that we have the three main dependent variables here plotted together. 
in using standard score, scores like Z scores. But the point is to show you that on the left, that we're not getting very much left frontal activity. We don't have very much anger and we don't have very much aggression. So basically, if they're in the neutral feedback condition for the next minute or two after they've been given the feedback, they don't show much left frontal asymmetry. They don't show much anger. They don't show much aggression. But notice what happens when they are in the aggression condition, when, sorry, the insult condition. When they've been given an insult from this other person, they show more left frontal activity. They show more anger and they show more aggression. And keep in mind then if it's the left frontal activity that normally would be associated with positive emotions or approach, this seems to be about approach. So we're now seeing that this is a negative emotion and people want to you know, approach that person. So that's how we're getting more left frontal anger, left frontal activity. We're also getting more ratings of anger and also they're more likely to give them that water that doesn't taste very good. So there's aggression there. In fact, in a um, participant by participant basis, looking at the individual correlations, you can see the amount of activity for the left over the right is what's being plotted on the x-axis here. And the more they showed activity um, following their, uh, you know, the, the people who were in that insult condition showed more left frontal activity, the more they actually reported feeling angry about the whole thing. So there's this nice relationship here between EEG activity and the anger. So that shows us from back in 2001 that, you know, anger does have this motivational component and that motivational component is indexed by greater left frontal activity. All right, so there's our nice little example too of how you could do this kind of stuff in the lab in terms of making people feel angry and measuring aggression. You got to think about how difficult this actually is to do in laboratory studies because you have to worry about ethics, right? You don't want to get people too angry that they're going to storm out and get all upset. You also have to be careful about what the aggression measure is because we can't really have people hurting other real people. So it's usually going to be fake aggression, but the participant doesn't know that. All right. So a lot of deception is found in usually in this kind of research, and it's very difficult then to, to do that kind of research because of the ethical issues that are involved. Well, let's move on then and look at some uh, research by a specific social neuroscientist, a guy named Tom Denson. Tom Denson is at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He's a professor there in the School of Psychology. He's very active and he's been largely focusing on anger-driven aggression. So he's interested in making people feel angry and studying the um, neural correlates of anger and provocation. He's actually done some research about video games and aggression and also social media use and violence. So these are all some of his topics. But I'm going to go ahead and give you three examples of research that he has engaged in in the last 10 years. Um, here's the first example. This is looking at testosterone and cortisol in aggression. So he does do work with hormones. So he's looking here at endogenous testosterone and cortisol. He examined in this particular study 2013, what's called the dual hormone hypothesis. This has to do with the idea that testosterone is associated with aggression and dominance, as we've covered in this course, and that cortisol is usually associated with submissiveness and low levels of aggression. However, it does appear from previous research, from looking at uh, research with rats and other humans, that the effect of testosterone is actually moderated by cortisol, such that testosterone only really seems to lead to aggression when the cortisol levels are low. So you, if you kind of think about these two hormones, they're actually kind of doing the opposite effect. So if testosterone is high and cortisol is high, this is suggesting then that um, you're going to have sort of like a conflict here. And so you won't get as much aggression as you would if, it, if cortisol actually was low and testosterone was high. So evidence for this hypothesis comes from things like lower cortisol and high testosterone patterns are usually found in violent offenders, people who are psychopathic, and even adolescents with conduct disorders usually typically show low resting cortisol levels and high levels of testosterone. So how do they do this in the lab? Well, interestingly, they looked at female undergraduates at the University of New South Wales. Each was randomly assigned to what's either the win or the lose condition. They collected saliva samples from them to measure their hormones, so they were taken twice, once at baseline and then post-test. The participants prepared a two-minute speech on a topic that the experimenter came up with, and then they were told that they were competing with others in a web conference or a web competition. And so the, an actor would give their speech first, followed by the participant. And then after they had heard the speeches, 
they were told that they were going to give written evaluations of each other, and they would receive an evaluation that was insulting. So, so this is very much like the um, Harmon Jones study where you do something. You remember in that study, it was actually writing a little essay. This time you've given a little speech and supposedly the other participant you haven't met, who's supposedly in another room, um, is giving you an evaluation and it says, your speech was kind of boring, to be honest. Your life goals seem vague and unrealistic. It felt like a waste of time listening to you. And so now you can see again, we're getting an insult. In this study, there is no control condition. So everybody gets insulted. So everybody gets a negative evaluation from the other quote unquote participant. And then they were told they were going to play a competition reaction time task in which they could deliver blasts of white noise to the other player while they were playing with them. So they have to press a button as quickly as they can to some prompt. And while that while they're doing that, the other participant can go ahead and deliver white noises to kind of throw off their game. And the more you deliver these white noises, the more you're sort of being aggressive towards that other participant. So that's how they measured aggression here. And at the end of the competition, while they were making this reaction time, they were told that they either had won or that they had lost. And that turns out to be an interesting manipulation, but it's not really that important in terms of determining aggression. All right, so what did they actually discover here? Remember, we have all this baseline cortisol and baseline testosterone that you can get from the saliva samples they take at baseline. So we have participants who have low cortisol and we have other participants who have high cortisol who come to the lab that way. And then you also have of those participants, some of them have low testosterone and others have high testosterone. And then what we can do is remember, everybody's going to get insulted. So everybody's been provoked. How does this then manifest itself in terms of the noise blast that they give when they were doing that competition? Well, you can see here that in the low cortisol group, so participants who had low cortisol and they had low testosterone, they didn't actually show much aggression. So these are people who've been insulted, they have low cortisol and they have low testosterone and they don't do very much um, aggression here during the competition. But you can see that under that condition of low cortisol, testosterone does make a difference. High testosterone causes them to blast away. They become more aggressive. Now, remember that the dual hypothesis says, well, maybe under high cortisol, you're not going to really see the effects of testosterone. And in fact, you don't. So under levels of high, uh, sorry, levels of high cortisol, the, high tes the testosterone levels don't make much of a difference here. It just seems like anybody who's sort of stressed coming into the lab just gives a lot of noise blasts and the testosterone levels aren't really um, having an effect on aggression. It only really seems to matter, testosterone's effects on aggression, when we're looking at the low cortisol condition. The other thing I can just show you, by the way, is what happened with the wins and the losses. And this kind of goes back to an old study that I told you about, about dog agility competition, that winning and losing actually does have some impact here. And you can see um, what's going on is that there's the baseline condition. And then they've gone ahead and um, been given feedback about whether or not they, uh, that person, you know, they were given that insult condition, right? So everybody's been in the insult condition. And then they now do that competition. And so there's 10 minutes post the comp after the competition is gone and then 30 minutes. And so you can see that um, if you're in the win condition, the, those people's testosterones go up if they win. If they're in the lose condition, the testosterones drop a little bit. But in the other conditions for cortisol, you can see cortisol doesn't really have any um, effects of winning or losing. So winning actually increases testosterone, but that's just sort of a side um, finding here, and it's not really essential to understanding the aggression. Okay, so that was just looking at how testosterone and cortisol uh, maybe contribute together in this sort of dual hormone hypothesis that um, Denson and his colleagues looked at. Here's the second example that comes out of the Denson laboratory. This is about self-control training with anger and aggression. Does it work? So this is a study that was published in 2020 in the journal Social Neuroscience. Self-control training involves the repeated practice of self-control over time. Now the self-control doesn't have to be about controlling your anger. It's just about the idea is that if you practice any kind of self-control, you know, just getting really good at, you know, having good self-regulation, self-control, then it should carry over and apply in any other places and any other times in your life when you need to have self-control. So self-control training means you're just going to kind of pick some sort of um, 
task that you're going to get yourself really good at and practice on repeatedly over time and get really good at doing some self-control. So Denson and his colleagues had previously shown that this sort of self-control training works really well on behavioral responses to anger provocation. So it wasn't a physiological study, but they found that if they could get people to practice self-control training, then they came to the lab and they provoked them with like an insult, that this actually caused people to get less angry, at least behaviorally speaking. So in this study that they published in 2020, the participants practiced self-control for two weeks, four. If they were in the control condition, they didn't. And then they were subsequently provoked while they were in the fMRI scanner to see what brain regions seemed to be affected by self-control training. This particular study had no hypotheses about specific brain regions that would be affected. So they were just doing this more as an exploratory um, uh, study at first. So here's how they did this. Um, they had 44 participants, 24 participants at the University of New South Wales that were randomly assigned to the experimental group and 20 that were in the control group. And for two weeks, the people that were in the experimental group would perform a verbal regulation task. So that's their self-control training. They would monitor and regulate their speech as much as possible during daylight hours. The instructions were that they were given specific examples to guide the manner of their speech regulation, including speaking in full and complete sentences, and refraining from using slang, abbreviations, and colloquialisms. So it's sort of a, almost a nonsense sort of self-control training, but the idea is that you're just gonna be really aware of your speech and try not to use slangs, abbreviations, colloquialisms, and try to just basically improve your speech and be aware of that for two weeks. And then they would complete online timestamp diaries every two days in which they either reported the extent to which they had regulated their speech if they were in the self-control group, um, and self-control training group, or they watched TV. So and the people in the control group didn't have to monitor their speech. They were just told to do what they normally do. And every couple of days, you're going to fill a little bit, a diary about how you, um, how much TV you've been watching. So the experimental group, again, is the self-control training group. And the, and the control group is just watching TV. So self-control training, if it's actually making people sort of more aware of what they're doing, they're becoming more mindful and self-regulating, then perhaps then when they show up to the lab in a couple of weeks and they're provoked uh, with an insult, they'll be able to better control their anger. And um, again, the idea is that it just would be something that works and, and they had seen this in other research that they had already done behaviorally, and they would be able to do the same thing here in the lab in an fMRI. So, while they were in the scanner then, all the participants completed anagrams. So anagrams are like scrambled letters, and you have to figure out what the word is. And on each trial, they would verbalize their answer, or they could say no answer when they couldn't solve it. These tend to be difficult anagrams, so I'm not sure if they were, any of them were impossible to solve, but they would be very, very difficult to do. And so a lot of the participants would have a hard time doing this and be able to have to say no answer when they couldn't solve it. But then they would be, inter uh, this should have been interrupted by the experimenter's voice. And the experimenter would say something like, speak louder. So you might say no answer, or uh, you might say aggression, or whatever the word is that you've unscrambled. But suddenly the experimenters can interrupt and say, speak louder. Or they might say, look, this is the third time I've had to say this. Can't you follow instructions? So the insults are actually coming from the experimenter. The experimenter is the one who's doing it. And after that, after that next prompt there where it says the third time I've had to say this, can't you follow instructions? For them, what happened was for two minutes, there was just a green circle put on the screen and they recorded them um, uh, their fMRI for those two minutes in a functional scan. So this was meant to be um, the part of the brain activity that would occur after they've been insulted and they're apparently provoked or feeling angry, okay? And then once they were done outside the scanner, they could report their emotions and how much they were trying to control their anger when they were in there in the lab. So again, we have some participants who've just for two weeks just been watching TV and doing other things. So they're not actually learning anything about self-control. And then we have the other people who've been doing this verbal uh, regulation task and supposedly increasing their self-control ability. And so perhaps those people would show less anger to the provocation of the experimenter insulting like them like this in the, in the experiment. Well, what do they find? Turned out that everyone reported feeling more anger uh, following the provocation. That is that both groups had equally high levels of anger following the experimenter insulting them. 
There were no differences between the experimental and the control groups, however, in how they felt emotionally or in control of their anger. So actually, here is a place where Denson and his colleagues did not replicate their previous research. They didn't find any behavioral evidence that the self-control training did anything to the person's self-reports of anger and aggression. But they still looked at the fMRI data, and they did find there that the groups differed in their posterior insulactivity, insulactivity in response to the provocation. So here's what you can see. This is the insula. And you can see that in the pre-provocation condition, before they've been uh, provoked with that insult, and they recorded them sort of like at baseline here, there's no differences really between the two groups. And um, then what we see is that the people who have been in, in the blue group are the ones that are um, in the control. Green is going to be the people who are in the um, self-control training, that they're showing less uh, insula activity, posterior insula activity, when they're provoked. So again, just because it's maybe not so clear here, is that the green bars represent the participants that were in the self-control experimental condition, and the people in the blue are just in the regular uh, control condition watching TV. And the people who have showed self-control training or have been through that are showing less posterior insula activity following that provocation. So the authors concluded that this area might be an area to focus on in future research on self-control training. Maybe those participants who show the most drop there in posterior intellectivity would be the ones who'd be best candidates for self-control training, for example. Um, like I said, this is an exploratory study. I think it's interesting to think about how you do provocation and get people insulted while they're in an fMRI scanner. I can tell you, by the way, that one of my uh, students several years ago tried to do this kind of research at the University of Queensland, and we couldn't actually get it through our ethics committee. Basically, the chair of the ethics committee said we would not be allowed to insult people and make them feel angry in a study, and so we never actually did this. Tom Denson, meanwhile, down at the University of New South Wales, doesn't seem to have this problem with his ethics committee. And so it could be that one of the reasons why Tom Denson has been so fruitful in doing work on anger and aggression, there's not a lot of other researchers that are out there, is because his particular ethics committee at the University of New South Wales allows this kind of research to be conducted, whereas many other uh, universities, including our university, University of Queensland, wouldn't allow us to do this kind of research. So that's sort of an interesting issue for ethics. Like, why is it that in different parts of the same country you could do something um, and it would follow ethical guidelines of that local institution, but in other parts of the world or in other parts of the country, you can't do that. Um, I just, I find that interesting. I wish I could do more of this kind of research, but I do understand why ethically it'd be quite challenging to do. Now here's a third example now of some work from Tom Denson's group. And this was published in 2020 in Group Processes and Intergroup Relations. This one doesn't actually involve any physiological measures, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking about how anger um, could be used to look at uh, intergroup relations. So what they looked at here was the contrast between fear and anger, two negative emotions that have very different um, you know, responses to them. Anger, by the way, remember we talked about the motivation there could be to approach people who are making you feel angry. Fear actually has sort of the opposite motivation, doesn't it? Motiv the motivation for fear is to go away, to withdraw. So they're very different emotions, even though they're both negative um, and using appraisal theories of emotion is what they did in this group. They argued that feeling fear makes a person focus on the uncertainty of future harm. So it's more future focus. So they're kind of like thinking through the appraisal theory of emotion. And they're thinking about this for fear. That fear, a lot of what goes on with fear is that you're thinking about the negative harm that this other person could do. But you're really uncertain if they're going to do more to you. There's more harm that's coming. And so... Fear is an emotion that would have associated with it more future focus. Like you're trying to say, is this, am I going to be further in danger if I stay here or if I keep putting myself into this situation? Feeling angry, they argue from this appraisal theory perspective, makes a person focus on what happened in the past and how others have chosen to harm us. So it's more past focus. So in terms of the temporal focus, fear is more future oriented. Anger is more past focused. So in an intergroup context, if people think about the future with the outgroup, if you're thinking about this group that is a rival group to your group, and you're thinking about what they might do in the future, it probably will elicit more fear. 
But if participants think about the past with the outgroup, then they might think more uh, about things that they've done to harm the group, and so that should elicit more anger. So this is all very generic and very general, but I think you can kind of see where they're going with this. They're just saying, if we go ahead and say this rival group, we think about them in the future, what might be happening, it's going to elicit fear because fear is future focused. If I say, think about what they've done in the past to your group, then it's going to make you feel more angry rather than fear because you're thinking more about all the bad things that they've done to the group. Okay, so what did they do in this study? Well, they did this in two different studies, one involving 138 university students in the United States. Another study involved 419 online participants. Everyone read a prompt about terrorist attacks. And what they did was they manipulated things like the temporal focus, whether they asked them to think about the past about these terrorist attacks or future terrorist attacks, or in another conditions or in another part of the study, they asked them to think about anger or fear. And they just wanted to see if these relationships between anger in the past and fear in the future would actually show up, right? So they also measured support for intergroup aggression, that they believed, you know, you, in terms of terrorism, the participant could indicate how much they agree with, an, with items like this, like there should be military action against countries that support and protect terrorists. So again, it's a very sort of rather generic description of terrorist attacks and terrorist attacks that have happened in the past, terrorist attacks that are going to happen in the future from some group outside your country. Um, and so if you think about it from the past, it should make people feel more angry. If you think about what they might be doing in the future, it should make them feel more fear. And whether you feel anger or you feel a fear, it should have some relationship then to whether or not you feel aggression. You want to have aggression, right? Now, you would think that anger would be the one that should lead to more aggression because we just got done talking about how anger provoked aggression happens all the time and happens in these studies that Denson's lab has looked at. But what about fear? Would fear also cause people to feel aggressive? Well, in all of these uh, data that they collected, they ended up running this analysis, this model that you see here. And this is just from study two, but they basically found this in study one as well, that when they asked them to think about terrorism from the future perspective versus the past, you can see that when they asked them to think about it more for the future, it led to more fear. So there's a positive relationship there between like being more future oriented versus past it leads to more fear. And then in fact, fear did lead to more support for aggression. But if you think about the future versus the past, it causes a, a negative relationship with anger. So they're less likely to get angry when they think about the future. But also that means then that if you ask them to think more about the past versus the future, that causes them to feel more anger. But anyway, when the anger goes down there, you can see that that also has a contribution to support for aggression. So both fear and anger have some contributions to aggression. And so it kind of tells us that maybe at that intergroup aggression level, there's a little bit about the uncertainty of the future that makes us want to go ahead and act against them. Or in the anger case, that when actually we make people feel angry um, about things that have happened in the past, it could also have support for aggression. So either one of those could cause somebody to feel um, more support for aggression towards the outgroup. So it just shows us that it's a little bit more complicated than just looking at anger, that fear also has a component associated with it that could also lead to this aggression um, that you wouldn't normally associate with fear. All right, so those are three examples from Tom Denson's group. Um, I do recommend that if you're interested in any of this work under um, that Denson and his colleagues look at, go find his website there at the University of New South Wales. He's, like I said, a very prolific researcher. And we're gonna talk actually about one more article that Tom Denson has written recently. And as we move now into this topic, implications for society. So this is the way that Sapolsky really wraps up his book. He's trying to take a lot of these different levels of analysis and say, what does this mean for, like, for instance, the way the justice system is? What can we do to prevent war? What can we do to, to increase feelings of peace and so on? So trying to find applications from all this basic research that we get from social neuroscience. So I'm going to give you two possible things here to talk about. One is look at treating violent offenders. And treating violent offenders, um, I got the idea to talk about this from this interesting article, again, written by Tom Denson, published in Social Issues and Policy Review. And what he's trying to do here is look at the problem of the cycle of violence. That is, when we look at violent offenders, those people who are most likely to commit the violence that we see in our everyday society, what actually happens most of the time when we have violent offenders is that we punish them by going, having them go to prison. 
and then they get released, and, and then when they re get released, they often reoffend shortly upon release. And then because they've now reoffended, they've created another, uh, had another violent episode. This leads to further incarceration, and the cycle just goes on and on. And so this is a very well-known finding among violent offenders is that they just don't seem to, the punishment itself doesn't seem to be enough to decrease the chance that they're going to be violent again in the future. So obviously that's not a very effective policy in terms of trying to um, get people to stop being violent just by punishing them every single time. So in this paper, he argues for a theoretical biopsychosocial model to reduce the cycle this violent cycle. And so he is going to recommend in particular interventions that directly target the brain that may reduce aggression through improved brain function. So he's taking a you know, rather social neuroscience approach here by saying, hey, we know a lot from social neuroscience about that things that lead to aggression. So maybe we could go ahead and come up with interventions that directly deal with that, this stuff that's going on in the brain. And so here's his model that he talks about. He says there are four violence promoting factors that affect brain structure and function. These are all things we've talked about this semester and, and in Sapolsky's book. Genetics could possibly be a contributing factor. Having adverse child experiences, extreme poverty, having abuse, um, heavy alcohol use, another thing that affects brains. And then we talked a lot about traumatic brain injury also can lead to violent offending. So now, as a result of those different factors, you end up with a person who has a brain that's aberrant. They have, their brain structure and function isn't working like it does for other people, normal people. And so there, then that would lead to violence and then punishment and then that vicious circle of violence causing punishment, which causes violence, which causes punishment, and so on. So his thing that he's adding here is this intervention that's in green in the model um, that could normalize the brain function. What could we do to normalize their brain function via what he calls moral bio-enhancement. So he's saying we need some new thinking here, new things we could do to intervene on those um, brains that are performing very poorly and leading to violence. Okay? And he actually does a nice review in this article. You might want to go and look at it yourself in terms of everything we know about what causes violence. And you can see it's very complicated um, in terms of the things he's looking at here. He's got a salience network, a mentalizing network, a self-regulation network, the reward and revenge motivation. All of these things obviously interact and depending where the brain damage is or where uh, genetics might play a role, any of these things could be contributing to um, the reason why this person's brain is causing them to be violent. So what are some ways that you could intervene according to Denson. So he calls this neuronormalization via moral bioenhancement. And so these are things that could possibly cause that person's brain to become more normalized. All right, so here are the three things he talks about. One thing is that he mentions is pharmaceuticals. So things like lithium. Lithium was found back in 1976 to reduce aggression. It also increases the gray matter in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the dorsal ACC. And by having that increased gray matter, increased connectivity there, perhaps people could do a better job of self-regulating. Also, we know that lowering serotonin via tryptophan depletion increases aggression, okay? So what we could do then is maybe enhance serotonin by having SSRIs that keep the serotonin out there in the synapse longer. That should actually decrease aggression. It's been found in different kinds of studies. So there are two possible pharmaceutical treatments that could be prescribed to people who have violent tendencies. Just give them lithium, maybe also give them SSRIs. A second possibility for more neuronormalization is just brain stimulation. And this could be done with TMS or deep brain stimulation where you stick electrodes right in there at places like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So stimulation of these particular brain areas has been found in some preliminary research to increase, uh, sorry, to decrease violent offending for certain types of people who are more aggressive or violent. And so maybe if they have this as a regular treatment, it would actually help them reduce their violent tendencies. And the third thing is actually more of a dietary or a supplemental uh, thing that could be added. And that is that diets that are rich in seafood may reduce aggression because of omega-3 fatty acids. And so what he argues is that maybe what you could do is use supplements to increase a person's intake of omega-3 fatty acids because it's already been demonstrated to reduce violence and crime among violent offenders. 
So in this combination of these three things, pharmaceuticals, brain stimulation, having diets more rich in seafood, you may help that brain become more normalized and therefore not be so violent. And so he's saying, hey, wouldn't this be a better policy than just sticking them in prison for a while, punishing them, releasing them, and having them violent offend again? So it's an interesting approach, trying to take into some of this research that we know from social neuroscience of aggression and violence and apply it to social policy. The other example that I want to talk about at this point is this work that's been done on empathy, morality, reconciliation, and culture. And this is an interesting paper published in 2017 in Social Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience. It's called Empathy and Moral Emotions in Post-Apartheid South Africa, an FMRI Investigation. And you'll notice, by the way, that Jean Dessetti is the senior author on this paper. Dessetti is that person that we've talked about in previous lectures who's done a lot of things on morality and empathy. Now, if you go and look in chapter 17 of Sapolsky's book, he talks a little bit there about truth and reconciliation commissions that are known as TRCs. And these have been established in the last 20 years in places like Bolivia, Australia, Nepal, Rwanda, Canada, and South Africa. All right? So there are these uh, truth and reconciliation commissions. Now, after apartheid was abolished in South Africa in 1994, Desmond Tutu oversaw or chaired a TRC that occurred there. It went on for several years. And what they did with this TRC is they would examine the acts of whites and also African liberation fighters that had occurred during apartheid. So really horrible things that the whites who were in the dominant uh, majority then, or sorry, the dominant control of apartheid, things that they had done during their time, and also um, things that African liberation fighters had done while they were trying to abolish apartheid. So they had both whites and blacks in South Africa um, being looked at in terms of all these terrible things that might have happened in, during apartheid. And the hearings were all public, and they had many, many victims, hundreds of victims, tell their stories, whether they were victims of the acts of whites or victims of the African liberation fighters. They also had six, more than 6,000 perpetrators. So people who were on both sides here testified, and they were given the option that they could ask for amnesty. And in a small percentage of cases, they did actually uh, give these individuals amnesty so they wouldn't be uh, subject to further fines or lawsuits or being put in jail, that kind of thing. Now, interestingly, in the TRC, they didn't have any apologies that were required. And it turned out that very few of the perpetrators actually apologized. There were no reparations made. And many of the perpetrators kept their jobs. So in some ways, it, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission doesn't cause anybody to feel like there's been an apology or there's been um, you know, some, some sort of restoration being made for the horrible things that one group might have done. It's more of just sort of a hearing out of everybody's stuff. It's, it's kind of like basically everybody gets a chance to vent or to explain themselves um, and therefore, it makes things more transparent and, and uh, available, right? So that's one of the reasons why people have these TRCs is just to help society move forward after something horrible has happened between one group and another group. And so you could argue that even though the TRCs didn't have any reparations made, people didn't go to jail, um, it did help transition South Africa forward instead of going back into having more revenge and civil wars and so on. So the TRC had this sort of calming effect on the population in the long run that didn't cause it to go back and have like people just want to go back and, uh, and have revenge for all the things that had happened during uh, apartheid. All right, so with that as the backdrop, what actually happened in this study? Well, in this study, white and black participants from the South African population engaged in two tasks while they were in the fMRI scanner. In task one, they looked at white, pictures of white and black faces that were shown expressing, expressing suffering um, to elicit empathy for physical pain. So basically, they had this standardized set of photos of faces expressing suffering while they're being physically hurt, like something is being uh, attached to their hand that's causing them pain. And you can see that it's either a white face or a black face that's showing that suffering. In task two, they were given short video clips of either black and or white victims who were testimony, uh, giving testimony in the TRC. And this was mentioned, this, these, these video clips are used to elicit empathy for social pain. So the short video clips here, you're hearing someone's testimony 
in the TRC, they're a victim about something that happened to them during apartheid, and they could be a black person, and they could be a white person um, providing that, and it was meant to elicit this empathy for social pain. Now, given the history of South Africa and its current events, the authors hypothesized that white participants would experience more guilt and shame in response to black victims' suffering. Whereas black participants, they argued, would show more moral indignation while viewing in-group members suffering. So they are suggesting different sort of moral outrages or moral concerns. Again, the whites are going to feel more guilt and shame when they hear what's happened to black victims. Whereas black participants, when they're hearing about uh, black victims versus white victims, they're going to show more moral indignation when they see what happened to their in-group. So that's what they hypothesize what happened, and here's what we now see. So in this study, they had 19 black African and 19 white Caucasian adults. Their mean age is around 40 years old, so these aren't actually university students. All had lived in South Africa during apartheid prior to 1994. In task one, they had these faces from that standardized set of black and white faces who were experiencing physical pain. In task two, they watched these video clips, clips to look at social pain. Okay, so in task one, it's not clear when you see the pictures whether you're talking about a black South African or a white South African. It's just a black face or a white face showing physical pain. You might remember from our previous lecture that when people are looking at in-group and out-group members who are showing physical pain, there's usually an in-group bias that we show more empathy for people in our own group experiencing physical pain. So that's actually something they expected they'd see here, that for at least for task one, when it came to physical pain, you should see that white um, Caucasian adults are going to show more in-group preferences or more concern or empathy for whites that are showing physical pain, and that the black African participants would show more in-group favoritism for them as well in task one. So in fact, that's what they found. They looked at regions that are associated with empathy in task one. And I'm not going to get into the specifics here, but you can see precunius is one of the things, TPJ. But you can see that overall the white participants are showing more activation when they see these faces of white pain versus black pain. So they're showing more empathy there and the empathy circuit. The black participants are showing more empathy when they see black pain versus white pain. So each group is actually showing in-group biases in favor of their own group having more empathy for them. Now what about task two? Task two was social pain, social pain that was actually a result of things like happening in apartheid. Did they actually see differences there as well? And so again, we have different regions that are associated with empathy, and there is here some increased empathy for uh, each in-group. So you can see that white participants, when they saw video clips of whites having distress in their, their testimonies, that the white participants actually showed more of these areas showing, uh, indicating more empathy for the um, white victims. Black participants are showing more empathy for black victims, again, for social pain. But what about those moral emotions, things like moral indignation and shame? Well, what about what happened there was we can look at moral indignation. You might remember that one of their hypotheses were that uh, the black participants are probably going to show more moral indignation when it comes to what happened to black victims in the task two. And in fact, that's what they see. So the blue bars here represent the um, black participants. And so the black South African participants are actually showing or reporting more moral indignation when they see uh, the testimony of a black victim versus a white victim. The white participants are not showing any difference here. So the white victims don't show a difference for white victims and black victims in terms of moral indignation. Well, what about shame? Shame is the other um, idea here that there's going to be a difference between the two groups. And remember that what the authors had hypothesized was that uh, the white participants are going to feel more shame when they see what happened to black victims under apartheid, then, and that we won't see the same sort of shame for our black participants. So here's the black participants. They're showing no differences in how much shame they feel when they hear the testimony of a white victim versus a black victim. But the white participants do show a difference here. So you can see they have lower shame when they see a white victim's testimony, but more shame when it's a black victim's testimony. So in effect, they are actually showing greater shame for black victims than white victims, these white participants are. And when they looked at specific parts of the uh, 
brain activity that happened with empathy, you can see that the precunius actually did a good job of predicting the shame in response to the black distress. And so um, that turns out here that the more precunious activity that you can see in these white participants, the less shame um, they had. And so shame seemed to be negative related to the amount of precunious activity. So it suggests that some of these regions that have to do with uh, empathy and sympathy may then spill over in terms of how much shame or guilt that you feel about different participants, um, sorry, different people in your everyday life. So try and put all of this together because it is sort of a complicated study. But note how some of these brain areas that are associated with empathy are probably also shared with moral emotions. So when we talk about morality and the emotions that are associated with morality, like moral indignation, shame, and guilt, the areas that are associated in this network of empathy are overlapping with those emotions. And so very often our morality is probably tied up with our feelings of empathy, the activation of the brain in terms of empathy. History, of course, plays a role in real group interactions and their prejudices. And that's what's really fascinating about this particular study, because they were able to look at people who had um, experienced apartheid directly in South Africa, and then how they responded to these uh, videos from the TRC. And they mention here, in the, as a conclusion, they say group membership affects how readily we project ourselves into the reality of another to share and understand their psychological state. Moreover, group membership profoundly impacts moral, emotional responding, and thus behavior. So our group memberships really are quite profound in terms of how they affect, not just in terms of our biases and prejudices, how much we like or dislike, but they can affect our empathy, and they're also fair affect whether or not we believe we should treat everybody the same in terms of morality. So that's the final uh, study to talk about here. And I've now covered everything I wanted to cover in this lecture. We talked about what anger is all about. We talked about anger and motivation. We looked at Tom Denson's research, and we've discussed some of the implications for society in this research. I do hope that you're reading along in chapters 15, 16, and 17. Sapolsky is much more eloquent than I am about all of these topics and has more pages and more time to cover them. But at least I hope that you get a nice sense of some of these studies that are relevant to these topics. And that's all I have for today's lecture.